Welcome to the 30th episode of Cartoon Avatars. I'm your host, Logan Bartlett. Uh, What you're going to hear on this episode is a conversation that Zach Weinberg and I had with William Hockey. Uh, William Hockey is the founder of Plaid, where he was president and CTO. uh, And then he's now the the co-CEO of a business called Column. Uh, This actually... might be up there for my favorite interview. Uh, William is a uh, very entertaining guy. Uh, Zach and he go way back, and he was very much a natural uh, to talking about plaid, talking about the industry, talking about his new company, uh, working his wife as his co-CEO as well, which is interesting. He has some hot takes on crypto, uh, although it's not a crypto podcast. I promise uh, that for all the people that are complaining about how many crypto podcasts we have. And so I would very much encourage people to listen to that. And then on the uh, on the back half of the episode, we have a conversation between Maureen Farrell, who was the author of The Cult of We. Uh, along with Elliot Brown, uh, they they wrote a book about Adam Newman and WeWork, as well as Brad Hargraves. Uh, Brad is the founder of a business called Common that actually shares a lot of uh, parallels with what it seems like uh, Adam Newman's doing here with his new company, Flow, that was announced this week, uh, that they had raised $350 million from Andreessen Horowitz. And so it was an interesting discussion uh, that we had about both what went wrong with WeWork uh, and what what uh, Adam's undoing was then, what he's been up to since, as well as what he's trying to do now. And so uh, definitely an interesting and topical conversation. Uh, so what you'll hear next is, is William Hockey, followed by the discussion on Adam Newman. William Hockey founder, co-CEO of Column, and founder, were you CTO of Plaid? What was the official title? Yeah, I was I was a president and CTO at Plaid. So, you know, un- unclear what that means. There's, there's still a lot of titles up on a LinkedIn. So. Yeah, I don't know. President sounds good. Sounds official. I mostly just try to copy Zach. I'm like, whatever Zach did, I would just, you know, Zach Weinberg, whatever he did, I would try to copy it. So that's typically the best path. So I assume you'll be joining the crypto podcast next week then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Web3? Honestly, don't get me started. I'm into it. Let's do this. Let's do this. <laughs> See, look, we got another one. Now we have a third amigo who wants to talk about crypto. Uh, and if there's someone who knows more about fintech than me, it's William. I don't even know if I thought about crypto as a potential topic, but I feel like, uh, you know, we might need to, if we have enough time left, I feel like we should bring it back to, bring it back to that. We can make it messy. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in for a fight. Zach, what was your, what was your actual title at, at Flatiron? Co-founder and COO. COO. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Another made up title that was a hodgepodge of different functions that I ran, uh, that were separate from what Nat ran. That was basically how we did it. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, uh, well, William, thanks for doing this. So, uh, you, Zach, you were an investor in, are an investor in Plaid. Is that uh, maybe, maybe take us through how you guys know each other? This is really curious because I have my version of the story and I wonder if it lines up with your version of the story, William. I'm like, not sure. This is like what they do at rehearsal dinners or something, right? It's like, you know, they, the, they're, they're, each person's giving their version of events. Yeah, I like this. Do you remember? Now I'm actually curious because, you know, you guys are, are memorable to us given you're the best performing company in our entire portfolio. Uh, do you remember the first pitch meeting that you did with us? Yeah, I, I think I remember most of it. I think there's a skill set to being a founder, which you have to be this forever optimist. And you just don't remember pain in your past. And so I really only remember things that were like in the past six months. And so anything past a year or two really bothers my wife. I have like no recollection of. But I mean, so, so Plaid is an interesting story. We, we started essentially in 2012 when like, it's weird to say this, but like FinTech really wasn't cool. The only thing that was cool was payments. It was like Stripe and Square. And so if you weren't doing something like that, you weren't taken seriously. And, you know, to their credit, the original idea that Zach and I had was pretty bad where we wanted to be in financial services and, and we can get to the story later if we want. Other Zach, your co-founder also, we, which we... Yeah, so it's very confusing. Zach Perret. We should go Plaid Zach. Yeah. Yeah, Plaid Zach. Plaid Zach and I had this. We like want to do something in financial services. We had no idea what to do. And so we decided to like do something in the consumer space. By the way, how did you decide like financial services was something that you wanted to actually go into? I mean, let's be real. Like we were all like 20 to 21 year olds, 
men. We weren't like super introspective and smart at that moment. I kind of feel like they they breed them a little smarter these days. They definitely do, by the way. The, <laughs> yeah. The preparation that these kids have. <laughs> I was like, what? Well, it's funny because I was I, I got staffed. So I was in investment banking in 2010, 2011, and I got put into fintech group. And I was like, this shit is so boring, right? I'm like, what? <laughs> I I was like, get me. I, I So I ran the software as like what, what I was trying to. So clearly, I mean, you guys are smarter than I too. All the software has been a good industry, but. They really are better, by the way, these days. Like the quality of the pitch relative to the shit you pitched me that was terrible back in 2012. Like, it's remarkable how good the young founders are right now. Well, they have podcasts and stuff to help them out, you know? I mean, I can kind of go on a rant on this. I think it's actually kind of worse. And this is maybe I'm just like a cranky old man at this point. I kind of feel like Silicon Valley, though, like puts everybody into this formula. You know, you're like, oh, you have to go to Y Combinator. If you go to Y Combinator, here's your pitch deck. Here's the recruiting email you have to send. Like, I feel like now startups are kind of by recipe. You're like, oh, enterprise, here's a recipe. Crypto, here's the recipe. And people just like rinse and repeat. And so it looks good and it sounds good. I don't think there's a lot of, you know, can't wait creativity, first principles thinking. And to our credit, I think when all of us started companies back in the early days, it wasn't like, you know, super, super crazy hard, but you kind of got to, you kind of had to make things up as you go. And so, I mean, the first time I put Zach, we were kind of doing this consumer app that was, am I allowed to cuss? That's like a dog shit idea. Yeah, 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 of course. Okay, it was a dog shit idea. And, you know, as you could imagine, Nat sat there like pretty silently and was like, mm, okay, okay. And then like Zach just like, you know, just like lays into it like five minutes, five minutes into it and kind of tells us how shitty of an idea it was. It, it really wasn't that surprising because we pretty much had 65 people before that also tell us it was a really terrible idea. Um, but we ended up going back a little bit later with a, with a slightly a, a different pitch, which is kind of what Platt is today. And we ended up conning them out, out of their money, which was, which was, which was quite good. <laughs> no, that's that was the story. They can't. They, I'm glad we remember the same story. I remember it's like my claim to fame is I passed on plaid, uh, and then eventually I said yes. But uh, yeah, well, and now you have Web three arguments and stuff. So you know that's it. Yeah, I'm never gonna outlive that one. Uh, no, they came and pitched this like horribly idiotic consumer idea where they were trying to like monetize people's credit card data. I was like, no one's, what are you going to pay them? Four cents a year. Uh, and it was, it was really bad, but, but at the same time, you could tell that they were sharp and learned quickly. And then they came back. I remember, I think we were sitting in the first round capital office in New York. Yeah. Over in, it was a like union square, right? Yeah. It was their old office. And you guys came back and I remember William, you in particular, walked us through this like problem you had discovered at least at the time you described it as like a data quality issue which was essentially like if you hooked up your bank account or i believe at the time it was even you were contemplating like credit card data as well and you walked us through actually like the effectively like the the data file that you would get back from wherever you were pulling data from and being able to actually turn that into mapping to you know uh a specific restaurant or a specific merchant or retailer or whomever it may be and like how messy and dirty it was. And that the idea was more about the data cleansing than it was actually like the API into the underlying systems. And then that at least was like very specific and technical. And that's why we ended up saying, ended up saying yes. And then I think you ended up tweaking it obviously since, since then. I don't know if you remember that like twist. I, sometimes as you said, like as a founder, you kind of throw out the, the bad history. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, I, I think I think that's really right. I mean, I think Plaid is an interesting, we kind of an interesting in story because we kind of came a securitous route into where we are today, which is most people in, in financial services at the time were very much focused on like the transaction. Everybody's focused on like the payment. And so how do we broaden payment acceptance, whether that be in person with something like Square or online with a brain tree or stripe or something like that. And I think we we thought, which you know, I think proved to be correct, is this entire other branch of fintech that is less about commerce and it's more about how do we provide these ancillary services. You know, we didn't predict it, but if you think about like the Robin Hoods or the Neo Banks or the wealth planners or the payment apps or something like that, those are all they need financial data that isn't payment related. It's it's not commerce related. And we recognize that we weren't smart enough to actually come up with that really interesting consumer idea. But we could probably make the process to build that a lot easier. And, and, and our unlock was actually the hardest part about building this was actually connecting that legacy institution. Because a legacy institution has the data you need, 
has the payment credentials and stuff like that. And so if we could figure out a way to deliver that to a developer, they could potentially build something really cool. Um, the problem was in the first two years, nobody was really building anything cool. Kind of think as, as fintech as we think about it right now really didn't come into prominence until you know 2014, 2015, 2016. And so really we were just kind of you know slaving away um, um, without a lot of traction. But I think luckily people like Zach and, and Nat believed in us and, and we got a, we had enough money to kind of work through those first couple of years and really wait until the market really started to peak, which it did. And now there's obviously these amazing companies out there, you know, like a Chime or a Square Cash or Coinbase or Robinhood or something that are these consumer staples. And, you know, we, we got a chance to work with all of them when they were, you know, one, two, three, four people. When you were early on, how did you decide from a prioritization standpoint between like new sources of data versus what I would think of more as like data quality enhancement, like making the data, how did you trade those off? I don't know if we've actually ever figured out the correct answer to that. Cause I think the problem you have in our space is you have a very classic long tail problem where most people bank with the top 20 institutions. And so the, the easy answer in the early days was, okay, like most people who go sign up to buy crypto on Coinbase, they're all coming from like three institutions. And so as long as we can cover that institution, we have a 90, 10. And so we're good enough to go. But as these problems start to go mainstream, that 10, 15% that can't onboard, they end up becoming extremely noisy. And so you end up actually not being super profitable on that long tail, but you have to do that in order to keep your customers happy. And so what we did is tactically for the first year or two, we focused on super high quality data on the first, on the top 20 institutions. And then over time, we really had to build out that long tail. I mean, even to an extent now, if you work, if you are at some like very small institution and you, th there's a chance you may not actually be able to connect with Plaid. It's something that we're, you know, there's 10,000 institutions in the US, we can't cover all of them. And so that will always be kind of a, a common problem. But the problem is that last institution we add, I don't know, maybe we'll get three people on in a year. And so it's not, um, it's not super profitable, but we have to do that. And so we keep consumer complaints down. We keep our customers happy and things like that. You know what I think? I mean, so many companies that pitch us over time uh, will say, hey, you know, we do this and then we can do the interesting stuff, right? And it's like, this is all, you know, we're just kind of doing this as a means and you're one of the few examples, I feel like, at least some, I, I don't know the big ones originally that you guys were working with, maybe maybe it was Capital One or, or one of those big institutions that you kind of had to do this in a, in a more, less pure way initially, right? And it was kind of screen scraping to be able to integrate the bank information with the the uh, the fintech product, and then you were actually able to get enough critical mass that they started to work with you. Is that right? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I mean, uh, I, this is something I always feel strongly about, which I do feel that sometimes companies in Silicon Valley is too obsessed with pure problems, right? We want like a very clean engineering solution, which is, hey, you know, the input is great, the output is great, and we're just transforming things in a somewhat in a way. Right. That's great when you kind of own the environment end to end, like on like your Slack or something like that. Right. You can control the distribution. But I think for us, we are probably the, the exact opposite of that business. Like Plaid, I'm just going to go on the record. It's a pretty dirty business. <laughs> There's nothing clean about it. And, and that always caused a lot of consternation. A lot of investors didn't like that. They're like, huh, you know, you're like, you're getting data from sources that you don't have like, you know, 10,000 page MSAs with. That's crazy. And, you know, and then, Consumers will go online and be like, oh, screen scraping is terrible. And, and I totally empathize with that perspective. But I think when you're a startup, you kind of got to do the hard thing. And usually that hard thing is dirty. And so absolutely, I mean, we didn't have a first contract with banks for years. And so we had a very, you know, I'd say tense relationship with a lot of them because from a strategic perspective, it kind of made sense, right? Where they had this data, they thought it was theirs. We were working on the, 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 we were working for the consumer and the consumer was like, Hey, this is our data. We want to be able to port, to port this over and things like in a lot of kind of the, you know, consumer data protection stuff and portability protection stuff that are popular now was not really a thing back then. And so we didn't really have the law on our side. And so we definitely had to do some stuff that I probably won't go into that is definitely pretty intense and, and pretty, um, and pretty dirty. And that's why we could charge money. And that's why we actually deliver a lot of value to our consumers is 
we were our customers. We never really had a problem where our customers were like, oh, we're going to vertically integrate and do what Plaid does. Everybody was like, oh my God, I do not want to do this. Thus, I'm willing to pay for this to go away. Because the, per- the long tail problem is so long, the, the, a lot of these banks are built on like old mainframe stuff. And so like you have to go, once you get past the big three, you're talking to community banks affect, I mean, probably, you know, 25 to 50 or community banks that are built on mainframe software. And so it's a really hard problem that only proliferates on down the line, right? Yeah, but I think, you know, dirty problems and kind of these like hard where like everybody isn't super aligned and there's conflicting interests. I actually think this is where some of the best businesses are made. It's like when I'm looking at, I'm not really invest that much, but when I do, I like these problems. I kind of like the problems where it's pretty hustly, it's pretty grindy, and it's very clear that if you can unlock it, you can drive a lot of value. I think if the barrier to entry into the problem is super low, like, I don't know how much value can you create? All you're doing is you're saving that customer time. If your pitch is, hey, you can do this in six months or you can pay us $9.99 a month, you know, that doesn't have a lot of sticking power. And I think if the answer is, hey, even if you have a thousand people in like three years, do you actually want to solve this problem yourself? And if the answer is no, then I think you have a pretty good business. <laughs> I'll tell you, I don't know if the statute of limitations on the flat iron acquisition has ended yet, but I'll tell you one like gross little story, which I'm sure it just like hearing you talk about this reminds me. We had to do similarly disgusting data integrations with like third party electronic health record systems. If you think like a bank has like shitty infrastructure, welcome to healthcare. Uh, eerily shit. Like, it's the same shittiness. Uh, uh, and so we have to do these, like, essentially these data pulls and there's no API. There's no like web hooks into this thing. It's literally like a MySQL database that we have to go and like find and copy over. Uh, and we're looking for like uh, all the like intricate nitty gritty healthcare data. And obviously the tables aren't labeled and there's no data dictionary. And so we're like, we don't know what this database looks like. I remember having this problem. We're like, we get all this data. We don't even know what it is. We have to go find the schema somewhere. Can we get like a copy of the schema from someone? Turns out the schema and like that data dictionary, essentially that like tells you what's in the database is considered IP. So you're not allowed to share it with us, but we needed to do the data integration. And I'm not going to explain, I'm not going to share exactly how we did it, but there was kind of like a briefcase in a hotel lobby type of situation where we got somebody to effectively share it with us. And we put it on a machine that wasn't connected to the internet. And we're like, all right, learn this schema guys, because like, we're not allowed to have it. Uh, and then we did the data integration and it's like, a, you know, those gross shitty problems are where the value is created because like uh, Google's not doing that. I, I agree. It, it, you know, if, if the government ever allows us to do anything to sell the company, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you lots of insane war stories about the exact same thing. <laughs> so. On that, like when you got to, because the advantage that you had were not, was not only that you got to the scale you did with, with Plaid, but then you also... Uh, suddenly there were other people that wanted to do this. And then you were like the, the best of the worst, uh, of the people, right? Cause like, you're the biggest and like, at least, you know, the banks already hate you, but they, they might as well hate only one of you. Right. And so then they started to be more accommodating to working with you. Was that kind of how the flywheel ultimately, because it went from like, oh, this is kind of gross. This company just does screen scraping to like the hottest company in Silicon Valley, right? And I think part of that was the fintechs all took off and all that, and you guys were the underlying infrastructure that enabled it. But then also it felt like there was a real domino that shifted in terms of like the some elements of the purity that people were working with you and the network effect really started going. Yeah, I, I, definitely. I mean, I think it is, is a business that definitely has a lot of economies of scale. Um, I think Plaid is interesting in the fact that it is you know, it's maybe somewhat similar to Flatiron, which is you can kind of only have one or two in, in the market because the market isn't like $5 trillion. And so if you want to build a big company, you kind of have to dominate the whole thing. And so you have to have to capture a, a good amount of the pie. And so I think, you know, luckily we've been, able to, we've been able to achieve that. And I think also the politics have changed a lot. And I think the bank's understandings of technology and fintech and all this stuff, I think has evolved. I think there was this nervousness kind of in 2012 to 2018 that I think has changed, which is, oh my gosh, these fintechs are here to take our customers and kill our business. I mean, I think if you really look at bank earnings, you look at fintech and stuff like that, that's actually not true. I think a lot of these things can run in parallel, which is I don't think, you know, Venmo 
has decreased, you know, net income of JP Morgan or Bank of America at all. And I think our pitch, which actually is true, is if you allow interoperability between your bank and these fintech apps, that actually locks the consumer in more. Which is, you know, if you've hooked up your Chase to your Square Cash account and your Robinhood account and your Coinbase account and your payroll accounts, that's really, really sticky. And if and and I think that was a hard narrative to say without data, but I think as this stuff got larger, we actually had the data to prove that. And I think now that I think that assumption is a little bit more market standard. And so there's less hostility between the two. And also, I mean, I own a bank now, and so I, I can kind of appreciate this. I think there's just a, it, it's harder to understand the risk of the ecosystem. And now that we're larger and have teams and we work with a lot of stuff, we can really help them underwrite everything better. And so we just know a bit more how to navigate. Because so we started this, you know, we're 22 or 23 and you're in there and you're getting yelled at by Jamie Dimon. Like, we're not going to be successful. We're not set up for success in that situation. But as you get larger and you have more people and you can kind of understand how to navigate these larger bureaucracies, you can do a lot better. And so now I think we actually have quite good relationships with the banks. There's always a couple that are a little bit more tense, but I think we kind of understand how to play the politics that we did, maybe did it when we were 22. Are we going to acknowledge that you dropped that you own a bank halfway through that spiel as like a casual, like, well, you know, I've got uh, some Balenciaga shoes, but yours is just like a bank. We'll get there eventually. I mean, everyone has their vices, Zach. You own a nightclub, <laughs> Nat has all these trading cards, and and William owns a bank. Speaking, speaking of which... Uh, at a, just cause like, I love the product stories. Were there any, were there any decisions that you look back on that you, cause there was competition, right? It wasn't just you guys in the beginning and then you broke out any product decisions or strategic decisions that you made that you can point to. You're like, thank God we did this thing a or B cause that drove the outcome. Yeah. Do you want the, it's, it's a little technical and complicated. Is the audience cool with that? Yeah, I mean, take us down is if I can keep up, I'm sure most of our audience can. But no, it just take us take us uh, down as much as you can. But I'm sure people would want to nerd out on it. Yeah, so I think the most successful decision we made was um, was actually owning the interface, like actually the physical design and owning the owning the client side. And so what that means is when we first started, we were this transparent infrastructure provider. And so the consumer had no idea who we were. And so let's say you were um, a fintech app. You would collect the necessary credentials for the consumer. You would send that to your system. You would send that to Plaid. Plaid would do what it needs to do and send you back the data. So so just to give the use case here. So, so Venmo, I have Bank of America and I'm signing up for Venmo for the first time. I need to deposit uh, money into my Venmo account. Venmo is a customer of Plaid's. And so... The integration uh, that ends up happening is powered by Plaid, and Plaid has the infrastructure that will go integrate into my bank and help deposit the money into Venmo. Right? Is that fair characterization? Yeah, exactly. That that that's that's definitely close to it. And so, what you need to do is, let's say you bank with J.P. Morgan, you need to hook up your J.P. Morgan account to Venmo, and so Venmo can pull money and send it to Zach. And so what happened is you didn't know as a consumer that Plaid existed in that flow. And we realized that this was kind of problematic because as a consumer, you were not getting the same experience hooking up your bank account to Venmo as you were when you hooked up your, your account to Square Cash, to Chime, to Coinbase, own whatever. And that had a lot of issues. It had a lot of security issues, but also had conversion issues because every application thought that their design was best or whatnot. And so what we decided to do is we actually made them kind of display a plaid designed UI to the consumer. And they in this case was Venmo or whoever, whoever your actual customer was. They had to, and you guys actually had the logo uh as well, right? It wasn't just the UI, it became the brand too. Exactly. And so we kind of made the application insert our branding, our logo, and all experience into the application. And that was extraordinarily controversial, as you can imagine, because these applications want to control the experience. And I, I totally empathize with them. But I think for us, what we recognized that we needed to establish some level of relationship with the consumer and provide uniformity across these applications, because we were the only one focused this hard on conversion. And what we found is when we did that, it actually started converting a lot better in the in the and the consumer actually started to feel comfortable, like, hey, I know this screen, I've seen this before. 
And it also allowed us to do a lot of micro optimizations around messaging certain banks and just allowed us to kind of have a platform that we could actually deliver content and software directly to the consumer. And it was never to actually cut the application out, but it was more to actually deliver a better service to them. And now 100% of traffic flows this way. And it's actually one of the only reasons that we have good relationships with the banks because those sensitive data never actually hits the application anymore. And we can also, if a bank wants to make you accept some terms of service or something like that, we can deploy that instantly. Or if a bank, you know, we need to take down for a second, we can immediately do that. And so it allows this kind of instant flexibility, but it was a very, very challenging rollout. You know, it took almost 18 to 24 months. There was a lot of pushback to it. But I think if we didn't do that, A, consumers would have a good enough experience. Also, we also would have got commoditized and it would have been really easy for these applications to switch it out. And it would just been a worse experience for everybody. But I think that I'd say probably generated like 90% of our market cap today. One of the other things we were talking about before you jumped on is like the culture of execution at a smaller, nimble company versus a Google. I mean, kind of the classic combo, but you just had like a really interesting example, right? Like you build this new UI, this new workflow is controversial. You've got to go roll it out to all your customers over like 18 to 24 months. You expect feedback that's not necessarily so positive and nice at all time. How do you do it? Like, what, how did you organize it? How did you think through that problem? What would you change? And when in the process, right? Because like, if you did it too early, they would have been like, fuck off. We're going to go work with these other people, right? And I think this may sound controversial, but I think this is kind of why founder, founder like companies win a lot is it was not a popular decision, right? You look at any sort of metric, you're like, okay, we're going to like pull consumers and consumers are like, I don't care about this. You pull our customers and like, I objectively don't want this. You pull the banks and they're like, we're not going to respond to your survey. <laughs> and, and you could... And you could clearly, and you could clearly pull your employees and you're like, well, this is obviously bad. And it was just something, I'll be honest, that I just felt very strongly about. And, you know, we were young enough that you can just make these high conviction bets and you say, I think this is right. I can't back it up with data, but we're just going to do this. And that was kind of how it works. And, and that's what we did. And it, and I think it was a controversial decision for three or four years. And I think now it's definitely the right, the right answer but it was just something that you have to have convection and just and just go with. I think it was also, we just knew, like I think as a founder, as an early employee, you just have so much fine grain, nuanced knowledge about this area that nobody else spends time on. And I see this with founders a lot is when they go try to do product interviews or customer interviews, they are assuming that the people they're interviewing has similar knowledge, interest, or insight to them. And that's just not the case. And so we just, felt like there was a bit of an arbitrage where we kind of knew where the industry was going to play out. We knew what the banks were going to react. And so we just made the, made the gut and did it. Did you personally oversee it? Did you like the rollout? Did you have a deputy who did it? How did you handle the actual operation? You know, we, we, we made it when we were small enough that I just, I just did it myself. And I, I do think when you have to roll out something as high conviction on that is you need to be responsible. Um, you need to say like, Hey, this is my decision and I'm just going to push this through. I think a lot of times f people w w are too obsessed with consensus and consensus can actually make product decisions slower and less effectual. It also allows you to distribute blame more, which is a bad thing. And I think you need to understand ahead of time, like, Hey, who owns this thing and who is the decision maker? And in that situation, it was me and we're just going to do this. And like, if it messes up, it's my fault. Nobody else's problem but here's what we're going to do and we're going to go do it. I tend to, you know, this is probably a little less popular. I do think when you're a smaller, smaller company, it needs to be a little bit more command and control um, from a product perspective. As you get larger and your workforce gets a bit more distributed, you obviously need to start deputizing people and passing ownership around. But for the first couple of years, you, you need to kind of suffer through some of these problems through force of will. Well, you're, you're telling me that you don't think every member of the DAO should vote on every product decision at all times, especially <laughs> in the beginning? Yeah, the, the tragedy of the commons is real. It's a real thing. And we're just starting to realize that now. <laughs> well, it's uh, Zach, he's not, he's not saying the member, the, the customers, in, in the DAO case, the customers are going to vote and then they're going to tell the, so it's the employee. Yeah. It's a, it's this big circular thing. Right. No, that's definitely, that's definitely better. That's totally, yeah, for sure. Yeah. The alignment with the customers being the employees is all, that makes it a lot better. Um, no, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I will say 
it's it's a there's kind of this like fuck you mindset that the best founders that I've worked with have that are kind of like, hey, this came from nothing. And I have it was just me or me and my co-founders in the early days. And so I could burn it down to nothing and I'll be fine. That was where it was when I started, right? Versus the whole John Scully coming into Apple as the professional manager, right? And the ability to make those decisions, you almost feel more of a steward for someone else's product, right? Versus if it's your own, you're kind of like, well, I re we were making this up as we were going along or in the early days. And so... I'm just going to keep making it up, even if it's at a bigger scale, right? So I think there's this attitude that founders could have that just leads you out of these, I don't know, the, in these traps that like a business school textbook would tell you to avoid. It's a really hard balance because, you know, what it takes to be a really good founder for 10 employees is very different than 100, which is very different than a couple thousand. And because, you know, in the early days, you need to be like, kind of dictatorial, you need to be extremely opinionated, consensus is the worst. And then when you're a thousand, if you're a micromanager and you're trying to make every single decision, it's gonna be terrible. And so as a founder, you need to kind of make this shift to like, hey, when is it my decision versus when I'm empowering people? And I think a lot of people don't really succeed in that transition. And I think a lot of times people don't really recognize, I mean, look, if you look at Zenefits, if you look at Uber, you have these founders that were just like, exceedingly incredible up to a point. And then they just like didn't morph well enough. But it's kind of hard when you're a founder, you're like, when, when do I change? Like, when do I go from like being a crazy, like when is being like opinionated and having a strong product conviction, when does that turn into like insane micromanagement? I don't know, it's kind of hard. And so you just kind of have to naturally make that transition. And so, so speaking of, I guess, transitions, uh, what, so, so you left when, when did you, uh, when did you step down from a day-to-day -day operational role at, at Plaid? Yeah. So kind of in 2019, 2020, you know, Plaid, Zach and I had been running the company for, you know, almost eight years at that point. And we decided to, um, sell the business to Visa. And at that point, I thought that it was a good opportunity to kind of step back and build something new. Um, I thought it was like, it'd be a pretty nice transition point. You know, everybody had a really great outcome. I thought it was a great buyer that would allow us to really continue our journey. And I'll be honest, I was a little bit nervous about the markets. <laughs> and so we thought it was a great outcome. Um, that obviously didn't work out. Um, and so then I ended up kind of staying on in the background for a while. For people that don't know, the there was a DOJ investigation into the whole, I mean, I'm sure you can't share all the details of this, but you sold for, how, how big was the acquisition? Five and a half billion or something? Yeah, so, so, so we sold the company for five and a half billion to Visa. Um, it closed and everything, but ended up, we ended up getting sued by the Department of Justice for antitrust. Not us being anti-competitive, but it was Visa was being anti-competitive. And so... Um, the acquisition ended up being canceled, but I had already kind of left at that point um, because I thought it was going to go through. And um, and so I ended up, you know, working kind of in the behind the scenes as we were getting sued and we ended up losing the lawsuit. And so um, ended up getting getting wound down. And so, you know, I think it's actually been off of the better. Plaid's doing amazing right now. I'm still on the board along with, you know, Plaid, Zach and I are the largest shareholders. And so I'm still very involved. But from a day to day, um, all my time is on something new. Maybe this is a controversial question. I'm not supposed to ask this, especially as a much smaller shareholder than you. Uh, do you think the kind of like current market conditions and the fact that obviously like fintech valuations are getting reset and it's going to be harder for smaller companies to raise money. I could see like there's good and there's bad, especially as like the dominant or one of the bigger ones. Like how do you view the current, let's call it market reset as it relates to, to Plaid itself? And obviously don't share anything you don't want to share. And just to add, by the way, some color on this, I guess, for people that aren't as close to the situation as you guys are. So it was a five and a half billion dollar sale, which is amazing by every you know metric. And then there was a period in which fintech totally blew up and it looked like, you know, I mean, your the most recent round was 12 billion. Right. And then that was and now fintech market has sort of cooled or the overall market has cooled off a little bit since all of that. So there's a bunch of like different, you know, points in time that I guess you're referring to, Zach, right? Yeah. So I mean, yeah, I'm I am still incredibly bullish on um on Plata. If anybody's any, you know, shares to sell it, go ahead and buy them. I think it's the best, it's the best business to be in 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 fintech. I think you have to be intellectually honest with yourself and look across fintech and say, hey, like were the valuation sustainable? Were some of these businesses actually fintech? I don't know. Um and I'll, I'll maybe point to a couple examples, which is I think like take loan origination, 
there's a lot of businesses out there that were simply just originating consumer loans. And they were like, hey, we're technology enabled because we have a good app and like we have engineers. Thus, we want to be traded on like, you know, 200x Ford ARR. Like that's bullshit. <laughs> like that's not a fintech company. It's a lending originator. It could be a really good business, right? Like loan origination could be a great business, but it's definitely not a fintech company. And so I think what you had is you had a bunch of businesses that I think were masquerading as fintech and the market got a little bit smarter and totally priced out. I think also, you know, there is a lot of, I think, consumer fintech that you have to be a little bit more insightful on, hey, what is the business model here? And are the unit economics actually positive? And I think what happened is when you had a huge amount of venture capital popping into the space, the cost of acquisition went way up. And then you add on to that, Apple made a bunch of advertising changes that made the acquisition go a bit higher up from there. And then you recognize that like, hey, how are we gonna monetize these consumers? And a lot of these consumers are being monetized just through pure debit card purchases, which makes money, but usually not enough to actually pay that consumer acquisition costs. And what you have is you have a lot of these kind of unprofitable segments. I, I don't, I think there's still a lot of amazing businesses out there. And I think FinTech will be super resilient and will continue to grow. But I think there's a lot of companies that are gonna have a hard time over the next couple of years and probably won't survive the next cycle. And I think that's actually healthy because I think there's a lot of bullshit in the space that was causing everybody to be like, oh my God, FinTech sucks, which is which is dumb. And so I, I, I wish them well and, and the stronger ones will continue to survive. I mean, like I also built another company that's powering FinTech. So I'm clearly a FinTech bull in the future, but I think I'm you know generally pretty bearish on the next couple of years. Makes sense. I, I always wondered like as a, large but not yet like a successful but not yet public business right where you don't have a liquid balance sheet and you know making acquisitions is still a little clunky you know how a market downturn plays out because on one hand you're going yeah you know my multiples are getting reset my valuation may come down or stay flat doesn't feel great on the other hand you're pretty successful already and now you've got stability in a way that maybe some of the up-and-coming companies or potential competitors don't and you've got this like window in time where you can actually expand or buy things or, you know, just kind of use your existing success actually as an offensive tool rather than, you know, having to worry about all these little companies nipping at your heels because they won't exist. Uh, that was kind of what I'm curious about. Yeah, no, and I don't want to, I probably can't speak too much on like plot strategy over the next couple of years, but I definitely, I, I definitely sleep pretty well. I think you're right. I think you have to look at yourself and say, okay, yeah, maybe my valuation isn't like the $30 billion that I could have got last year. But like, does that really matter? I think everybody's expectations have kind of reset. And I think you kind of reset in line with everybody else. But hey, I have a super strong business model. I have a lot of cash. I think that, hey, there's a potential, a lot of really interesting things that we can do, whether it be getting really great employees, whether it be potentially doing a little bit of M&A on some depressed prices. I think there's a lot of really interesting things to do. I think you just have to be condescent that I think, like, I, I, I think, I don't think we're in a blip. I think we're probably in a bit of a valley. And so you have to, you have to understand, Hey, can we do this strategy for four to five years? I think a lot of people in the industry are assuming things are going to pick up in a year or two, which I think is, is probably not accurate. And so you just have to make sure that, Hey, I'm good for the long term. And I think, you know, you also have to, I don't know, only losers pick the bottom. And so you have to be smart on when, when you're going to pounce. And I'm not quite sure we're there yet. Maybe we, we've alluded to this a few times, but uh, so your your new project, uh, so you bought a, a bank. Uh, maybe take us through like, what was the journey to ending up here? Uh, and yeah, like what you're, what you're doing today? Yeah, I think there's, there's two ways to kind of look at what I'm doing now is, is one is from an industry perspective and what the product is. And then the second is kind of how we're doing it and why we're doing it. And, and maybe the second one is slightly more important but I think from an industry perspective, what we do is we purchase a bank. And what we do is we provide financial infrastructure to other companies. And so what does that actually mean? Which is there's a lot of companies out there, whether it be an enterprise or a fintech company or pretty much anybody, and they want to do bank-like activities. So that could be, I don't know, I want to loan money, I want to hold money, or I want to move money. In the US, if you want to hold money, move money, or loan money, that is a monopoly. And the only people that can do that are a bank. And so historically what that meant is the, the, the bank is vertically integrated. And so they're going to have the consumer presence. They're going to have the brokerage business. They're going to have the payments business. They're going to kind of be like the Walmart of, of, of banking or financial services. And I think what our thesis is, 
and say, we're going to be that regulated entity. We are going to be that bank, but we're going to allow you as a third party who's not a bank to be able to do stuff like that, whether it be hold money, move money, or lend money. And we're going to do that in a very developer-friendly way, in a very kind of, I'd say, like non-bank-like way, where we can actually be have great developer experience, have great customer service. You know, you know, talk to me instead of, you know, some random old guy and things like that. The way this manifests itself before this was people were loaning out essentially their bank licenses, right? So it was kind of this kludgy thing that someone was acting as a bank, but it was really another bank's license that was liable for what that person acting as a bank would do, but it was one step removed, right? How did this work before and what like what made you tackle this problem? Yeah, I think unlike Pla- at, at Plaid, we kind of invented something new. We were like, hey, this thing has never invented, like happened before and we're going to invent it. I think what I'm doing here is like this industry has already existed. I'm just probably doing it a little bit better, faster, stronger. Because how it worked before is you had this very complicated supply chain where you had these community banks that were sensibly wrenching out their charters, but they didn't really know what people were doing with it. And what happened is you had these banking as a service providers that were these technology companies that would sit in between the customer and the bank. And they would provide the APIs, they would provide the developer experience, and they would kind of pass all the risk and complexity up to the bank. And the bank, you can kind of think about it as just a bunch of random people with a charter, they would then outsource all of their technology out to a core. And these cores are something called FAS, Fiserv, and Jack Henry, and they provide all of what you actually think a bank does. And so we looked at the space and we're like, this seems kind of overcomplicated for something that should be, you know, relatively simple. And so we are a bank, but we also have built all of our own core. We built all of our own developer experience. And so if you want to do something, all you have to do is come to us and we'll kind of provide the end-to-end solution. And there's a lot of complexities to that around balance sheet and compliance and stuff like that I could probably bore you with. But you can generally think about it as we took this really elongated supply chain and condense it into one institution. Was there like a, a a wedge product in this that you felt was like clearly a problem for customers and that would allow you to wedge in? Or is this one of these situations where a more complete holistic service has to be available before anyone will make the switch? I, I think it's a little bit of both, which is I think we had a conviction that this market is massive, right? There's a ton of people that can win in this space. And I think what I wanted to do is just build a really great developer experience. And what I learned from Plaid is it's really hard to build a really great developer experience unless you control your entire end-to-end flow. Because if I don't actually own the bank or I don't own the core, I can't actually deliver you a good service because I have partners upstream that could mess up. And that's a little bit what happens in the industry right now, which is you have these really great companies that are super smart, they build really great technology, but they've ostensibly kind of offloaded a lot of the technology and the responsibility upstream to people they don't control. And so they actually can't deliver a good experience. And so they're like, hey, you know, sorry, this thing failed. It's not my fault. I've called the guy three times and he won't pick up his phone, but like, hey, I'm trying really hard. Please like, don't hate me. And, and it's kind of hard to blame them. But with me, I was like, at Plaid, we didn't really control the entire experience because we had to call up to banks and that caused a lot of issues. So this time I was like, hey, if I'm going to do anything, I want to control the entire thing, all the ways up to the Fed and back. And that's kind of what we did. And so in many ways, it's just a high conviction bet that I think, hey, this space is going to evolve a completely vertical solution that is controlled end to end. It it will be the winner. And I think it's going to take me 10, 20, 30, 40 years to get there. But if we do, I think we have an opportunity to be the largest and most important financial institution out there. But it's a really long journey to get there. Well, after those 30 years, you'll be, what, 36, 37? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I'll just be slightly older than you. It'll be great. <laughs> you alluded to we uh, uh, a few times. So, uh, Colm, you actually started with your your wife as well, right? And you guys are co-CEOs. Yeah. And how was how did that come to come to be? I, I've, uh, yeah, I, I've actually, I, we have one or two in our portfolio, but it was this something that you guys wanted to do from the start or were you just ruminating on it and sort of thought it made sense uh, at some point along the way that you were ideating? 
Yeah, I think, I think I'm really lucky where I, I have a partner, a wife that's you know much more sm smarter and more talented than I am. And so I think we've always wanted to do something together. But I also think from a relationship side and a success side, it makes a lot of sense because when you have when you have a, a partner or even a, a you know a co-founder, you're constantly you're constantly struggling with like your incentives, right? Which is if you're a co-founder, like are your incentives aligned? But when you are married to somebody, your incentives are definitely aligned. And I think it actually allows us to make much more, I think, I don't, I don't say like selfless, but like very like company focused decisions because every decision we make, like, I hope she's right. <laughs> I hope I'm wrong because whatever happens, we have the exact same incentives. And I was very lucky at Plaid to have an amazing co-founder where I think I always felt that our incentives were, were very aligned and we had an amazing, still have an amazing relationship, but I've seen too many other co-founder relationships struggle with that. And I was not, I didn't think I could, you know, hit, 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 hit well twice. I didn't think I could find a co-founder that I had the perfectly same incentives with. I also don't think I was strong enough or tough enough to start a company by myself. And so for having my wife, who happened to be super smart, started with me, I think seemed like the logical decision at the time and still is. Super cool. I, like, it's just amazing to me that you guys can make that work. And it's like power to you for getting it done. I do think the aligned incentives take is really fascinating. Uh, I always felt that with, with Matt, that like, even if we would, you know, fight to the death about an idea or a decision or whatever, someone's making this decision because they think it's the right thing to do, not because they're chasing something that like benefits them and not the other person. I find a lot of times the co-founder blow up ends up being because somebody wants the glory. Someone wants the press and the PR and the like, you know, the newspaper articles or whatever. And that's where the misalignment, it becomes more of like a me versus we. And equity is supposed to solve this. And for some reason, it doesn't, it doesn't always work. I think that's right. I mean, I think we always, you know, Plaid Zach and I always look to, to Nat and Zach as inspiration because I think they were one of the very few co-founders that were, I think, ostensibly equal. And I think Zach and I always try to model that with that. Cause I think there's this kind of common situation where you get this like charismatic business CEO and they're going to go try to find some, you know, L7 engineer at Facebook to go be the CTO because they can't code or whatnot. And even though the equity is the exact same, there's this kind of like inherent power differential. And I think that can cause a lot of conflicting differences. And so usually it's that second tier person or their product or tech person who, you know, leaves after a couple of years. And I think obviously Zach and Nat were very successful about that. And in my, my co-founder, Zach and I, and I thought we were very successful about that, but I think they are rare. And so finding a situation where you are both equal, not in equity, but also kind of in, in power, I think is quite hard to find. I find that now with my two new co-founders of the biotech work I'm doing, which I haven't talked publicly about too much, but they just have such complementary skill sets to me. They do things that I could never do. I do some things that they can't do. And there's this like mutual respect that sits there of we are better together than we are apart. And that's kind of what makes it work for now. <laughs> yeah. And in our case, uh, Zach doesn't want any credit nor to be really associated with this podcast. And so it's actually pretty easy in my case where I, I get to either take the blame or credit myself. So. Yeah, when you're gonna get a little cartoon avatar of Zach and put him on the uh, put him on the website, is that gonna be soon? <laughs> he keeps asking me. I said no. He won't take it. <laughs> I've offered this before. I've offered. Uh, I actually changed the Twitter bio that said like uh, hosted by Logan Bartlett, and then in parentheses it says Zach Weinberg won't be called a host or something. Uh, was is what it says. So that's the new description. Well, I think it's actually pretty smart. I don't want to be tied down, Logan. Yeah, like like when I like when someone like me says something that's gonna get them canceled, like. Zach wants to be able to, you know, cancel you. And he can be like, I don't know what that is. Look, I was never in the bio. So I think it makes a ton of sense. This is really, there's really like uh, this, this capped upside and like uncapped downside in podcasting. So I am uh, <laughs> into it. <laughs> I will say every once in a while, as I told Logan this, every once in a while, we're raising money for this new biotech work. Uh, it's called Curie Bio. I'll talk about it in six months, Logan, when we're actually public about it. But like, Everybody, every once in a while, I get an email from an LP saying, really excited to meet, learn about the work you're doing in biotech. Are we going to save any time for crypto conversations? Because they've actually watched the crypto thing. And I still, to this day, it's probably happened like five or six times. I'm still not sure if it's good or bad. I'm like very conflicted. Like I, I 
do you think I'm distracted? Do you like crypto? Are you worried I'm going to critique it? Like, I, I just, I can't get a, my finger on the pulse. So that's part of why I love it. I like the optionality of fading into the abyss, you know? Have you had like Aaron Levy on the podcast where you guys just like circle jerk around crypto for like uh, for like two hours? Because like I would I would listen to that. <laughs> I would love to. I also people people don't know like I've known Aaron since I was eighteen because he was one of the first founders we ever met when he was starting Box. This is like way back in the day, so I've known him for a very long time, and we used to just like joke and DM each other and on on Twitter about the crypto stuff uh, when it was first coming out. So I've I've interviewed I had Aaron on myself before Zach sort of came in. And then there was this period where like the Web3 debates really took off where every Saturday, Zach and I got an email from Aaron with like show notes or something, uh, just like commentary on the episode. And uh, now we should have him, we should have him come on and do just, just mess around at some point uh, now that we're- We have to wear Larry David wigs if we do it though. The very curmudgeonly group here. So, so like, I, I'm just more curious, like in- that because I, I struggle with this as well. And so, you know, I'm a little bit more like Silicon Valley is a bit of a mafia believer. Um, so I'm a slightly conspiracy theorist, but you know, we have billions of dollars that go into crypto. So, you know, like Andreessen's crypto fund or like Paradigm or whatever. Like, do you think these things are going to go to zero? Because like, I just don't think there's ever been a venture capital firm that's just gone like to zero, right? Where they have like absolutely no assets to return. And because like, I don't know, like maybe I'm too much of a province here, but like I think Andreessen's actually pretty smart. And so I kind of feel like they already have hedged against this fact that like crypto is going to zero. And so I just like, I did, I'm trying to figure out like where this ends. Well, you have to de-untangle like the venture fund from the end result because, you know, it's always the retail person holding the bag usually at the end of the day and like clever VCs will find their way out of this problem in this market, I think. So it's one of these things where it's like, Will the long-term returns for a long-term hold look good? No, but will they actually hold through the long-term? Like probably not. I, I, I just, I think it's a, I think it's a law of physics problem. It's exactly what you said, which is like, there's probably something here. It's some combination of like a little bit of Bitcoin, some like weird decentralized apps that run on Ethereum, and then some like gross, disgusting financial plumbing between third world countries that like have no banks. And it's like, okay, cool plus some like NFT stuff. And if you add it all up, 10 billion, 8 billion, you know, whatever, something like that. Yeah. We've done so many of these podcasts where it's just like me yelling like a crazy old person about use cases, uh, which sometimes makes me feel like I'm like shouting into the abyss because I am. But like you compare and you contrast the level of specificity when you get somebody who actually knows what they're talking about, like William on the podcast and talking about not just like the intricate nuanced details of the technology, but actually like why the customer cares and how they're going to pay for it and can do it at this like very intricate level. And then you talk to a bunch of the other like Web3 oriented founders and it's very like, imagine a world that's just like still to this day, like I hear myself saying out loud, out of curiosity, because I have to go here. You know, you're in financial services broadly and obviously in the in the guts of the financial system from a technology standpoint. How do you take, like, what is your perspective on the crypto role, if any, in the like underlying guts of the financial system, separate from payment, separate, you know, I guess just like your life philosophy, if you will, on the Web3. Yeah, I, mean, I think you have to kind of, you have to, you have to break out Web3 and crypto, but I can kind of give you my hot takes on the entire thing since that's what we all want. Um, I, I, I think crypto and Web3 is really great at one thing, which is trading and speculation. And I think as you think about the intricacies of like securities markets, think about like market makers and stuff like that and the exchanges, I think crypto and Web3 is super interesting there. And so if you want to build really good trading stuff and speculation things, I think crypto and Web3 makes a, makes a really great point. But the problem is, is you kind of have to boil it down and you have to say like, okay, like, and then what? Like, and so like, what are you going to trade on the thing or the thing that you are trading, what use case does it have? And I just don't think we've answered that. And I don't know if we will answer that candidly. And so... I think generally, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm a little bit more bearish. That being said, uh, I am a, I'm a tactician. I like solving very immediate problems. I like solving very clear use cases. And I have definitely missed a lot of really interesting boats. And there's a reason I'm not an investor because I, it's hard for me to say, this is what I think the world's gonna be like in 25 years. And I'm gonna go make a high conviction bet on 
these various industries. Um, I think also where we've made a bit of a mistake in crypto is we've associated it with the internet where people are constantly like, hey, this is the early days of the internet. And so we just have to be like super bullish on our thesis holds. But I don't think they're really students of history, which is the internet actually started the exact opposite way of crypto, which is, hey, we have this very tactical use case, which is like, we need to like communicate digitally between these academic institutions, these military institutions. It had like perfect product market fit. What it suffered from was actually distribution was bad and there actually was a lack of vision. And so over time, people started to build up over time. And in crypto, we kind of did the opposite, which were like, hey, we have this really compelling vision, which I agree is super compelling, which is, you know, you don't have single party counterparties. So you don't have any sort of centralized institutions. Everybody owns the thing. And then we try to back into a use case from there. And I think we just solved it wrong. And I think the other thing that we've messed up a little bit is we have kind of rebuilt as we've started to scale crypto, we've rebuilt a lot of the problems that they were trying to solve. So if you look at everybody who's actually providing value in crypto, they're simply just centralized solutions, which is nothing wrong with that, but we've simply taken a centralized approach. And then you have to look at it and you say like, okay, like what value are we actually adding? And I don't think there is one. If I could kiss you through the internet, I would do it right now. No, I just like, it's... That's that's the the thing that always drove me a little crazy, and this comes down to I think you you nailed it in terms of like the history of the internet, and it's honestly just like a phenomenal branding exercise. Is this idea of like Web three as if it's a new internet, and actually, if you look at the history of the internet, it as you said, right, it started with this like very specific use case, and what we lacked was the five thousand other things you could do on top. But we solved like a really very specific communication problem day zero. And that was, you know, what we could build on top of. And here you're, you're, you're starting with like speculate on this thing that might have value downstream and going in the reverse order. And that tends to not find great product market fit. I think there is value somewhere. I think there is value inside of DeFi or crypto. And I just don't think we've discovered it yet. But I think we've been, there's been a lot of charlatans in the space that I think have unfortunately kind of misled a lot of people and got everybody distracted. And so I think, you know, from a 10 to 20 year perspective, I would, I would not be surprised if there are really great businesses. I just don't know what they are yet. I think the other problem is, and this is a problem that all of Silicon Valley has, is we don't think something's successful unless it's a hundred billion dollar business. Which is like, honestly, what if like crypto is amazing, but it's actually like a $4 billion like market maker? Is that a failure? Like, I don't know. But like everybody would assume it was. Everybody like, came out of the, the gate and were like, hey, here's this new thing. If this is not a trillion dollars, it's a failure. And I think sometimes when you're innovating in an industry, you have to kind of maybe pare down your expectations and say, hey, let's start a bit smaller. And so my gut is I think crypto and DeFi is going to be around, but I think it's going to be like a couple billion dollar business here. It's a couple billion dollar business here. And they're solving a little bit more niche problems. Like, I don't know, they're providing like stable coin solutions as like remittances to like in between second and third world countries. Okay, cool. Great business. It's like better than Western Union. Is it the next, you know, Stripe plus Facebook plus Google? No, but it's providing real value. Maybe in 10 years, we've taken out all the market makers that are just like, you know, coupon clipping trades. And now it's more decentralized and the actual end nodes make money somehow. I don't know. And like, that's a great $5 billion public company. Yeah, cool. I think that's probably where the world's going to add up. Yeah, people struggle with the math, right? They look at it and they go like, this is game changing. And then actually when you do the math, to your point of you know international settlements to replace Western Union between a few third world and second world countries that don't have like trusted banking systems between them. Sure, but you know what's the market cap of Western Union? Three billion. Well, and that's where I feel like it's VC's fault in a lot of cases with this is like, when you're pumping $26 billion last year into this ecosystem, it's very hard to figure out uh, utility and what's not speculation and what actually, like it just, it really uh, leads to a lot of different perverse incentives. And for people to feel like they have product market fit when they're really wash trading enablement or, you know, they're like, it's just, it, it's like they're, they're robbing one person to pay the other and then they're skimming off the top and they think they have a business when in truth, it's just this big circular jerk that's going on. Right. And like, it's not a product market fit that exists. Yeah. Look, if you raise 
30 billion a year for four years, it's let's just call it a hundred billion of dollars that are, you know, looking for returns and at, at a minimum two X, right? So you're searching for 200 billion, probably more of returns. And if the whole market size is actually to William's point, 10, 15, whatever, I don't know, something that's not 200, uh, that's where you run into issues. And that's probably what ends up happening, right? You see a bunch of like interesting companies that are pretty small in the grand scheme of things. And as a percentage of the total dollars that entered the ecosystem, it's just like mostly lighting that money on fire. But a few things will 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 emerge that have some stability to them potentially. Well, William, I think it's interesting. I mean, this kind of dovetails into uh, your funding path here, uh, where you actually haven't raised venture capital, right? And, and you're you're funding this yourself. Where Plaid, you you raised a bunch. What what were kind of the inputs uh, into that? And is that like a just this like? For now, as you sort of figure this stuff out and on your own timeline, do you think like that's the way you're going to run this company in perpetuity? Uh, like, ha- ha- what what were the inputs into it? I, you know, I, I think it, it kind of depends on how controversial I want to be today. I think, yeah, like, like r- r- right now, <laughs> r- right now, we're completely kind of owner and founder. So I guess, you know, employee and founder owned and operated. And I think that's what we'd like to be for the foreseeable future. You know, I don't know. There's some crazy, some crazy tale of that happens, and you know, we we need to be outside capital. I'm not intellectually opposed to that. I just think that would be a non-optimal outcome. And I think it, I think I wrote a blog post about this that, that got a little bit of heat and pub- and publicity. But what I said in it was, I don't think venture capital is right for me, but it's totally right for a lot of people. And I think it just depends on what you want to do. Which is, I've started a company before, and it was you know, hopefully it's successful. But I like to do high conviction things once. If I wanted to go do like 10 to 15 things, I would totally raise a bunch of venture capital because it de-risks my entire portfolio. But for me, I want to dedicate my life for the next 20, 30 years to one thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a little bit of money. And so I can put my money where my mouth is and put it all in the one thing. And I think that's a much more empowering story to my clients and to my employees to say, hey, like I'm in this with you. I'm not trying to de-risk my position with somebody else. I also think that you have to understand where venture capitalists add value. And I think for me, I'm not totally sure where they do. I think as a young founder, they add a ton of value, right? Because you're like, hey, you know, Logan at Redpoint invested in my company. My parents and my employees know who Logan is. Thus, they are going to get legitimacy. Thus, I can close these candidates more. Or these clients will think I'm legitimate because Redpoint Everybody knows Redpoint. Thus, if they invest in my company, you know that's really safe. I think, candidly, we have less of that problem here. And so I'm not 100% sure where the value is. And I think what I care a lot about is, you know, it's kind of overused, but like looking at businesses from first principles. And, and I think a lot of times people raise venture or like go do the next round because that's what they think they are supposed to do. They're saying like, hey, okay, cool. After I raise 100, I need to go like hire an executive coach. I need to hire like a chief of staff and I need to go like, you know, raise my series D from like the top tier venture capitalists because that's what my friends do. That's what Stripe did. That's what somebody else did. I'm just going to like follow that pattern. And I think very rarely do people actually pull back and say like, hey, is this right for me? Should I actually think about this creatively? And so, you know, when I did that, I think the answer, the answer was no. I generally think if if more people did that, I think um, they would probably take less venture capital. But I think venture capital is an incredible job branding. And if sensibly said, hey, this is the only path to be a successful company, thus you have to do it. Um, and, you know, they're probably right in like 99% of cases, but in the 1%. I actually think they're wrong. I I. I think that I agree with you, and it's sort of a trope of like VC discouraging founders from raising venture capital. I feel like it's a, hey, you don't want this type like thing that people now kind of joke about. But I actually uh, try to discourage a lot of people, like the, the best way to to make a lot of money is to own 100% of your company, right? And like the best way to control your own destiny is to own 100% of your company. And so, especially as these fund size have proliferated, there's so many perverse incentives that exist between venture capitalists and their uh, and the entrepreneurs that they back 
And there's generally some like ab natural absorption point that a market has and, or that like a natural size that a market can be and therefore what a company can be. And venture capitalists often will push, you know, it's almost like they'll, they'll make the, what is it, for raw, right? Or what, uh, what what is it where where the animal just gets fed until yeah that's for for God, yeah <laughs> that's that's it it's like they'll just keep feeding it beyond the the healthy point of uh of what makes sense and so I, I actually am refreshed uh I mean it's nice to see people like yourself now your situation's a little unique both in terms of your your means to do this yourself as well as the longevity of your ambitions as well as your comfort in doing things differently from a first principle standpoint to use your language. But I'm encouraged by like the alternative capital sources that are popping up more and more of like, hey, we'll give you this type of line to fund your business. Because especially some of these SaaS businesses, they're not the most uh, complicated things to underwrite. Um, and so it's not like you need this high valuation, you know, high dilution uh, lots of capital. You can get it incremental in different sources. I think banks have been a little slow to catch up or different lending sources have been slow to catch up to that, but I think it's happening now. And so hopefully more people will take a slightly different path than, you know, has happened over the last, whatever, two or three years, especially. I think it's five years will be pretty interesting because I think it, it will cause people to have to be a little bit more self-reflective on why they want to start a company. Because in the past three or four years, it was, it was pretty sweet, right? You'd be like, I was an early, I was an employee at Flatiron. I found this niche problem. And so I'm going to go leave and I'm going to go easily raise three to $4 million because I put Zach Weinberg out on my resume and he can, and he can vouch for me. And then at like, you know, a year and a half later, I can send to sell 2 million bucks in second day. And now I'm completely de-risk for anything I do at this point. And I don't actually need to make that much revenue. I just need to slap a bunch of logos on a page and like, I'm good to go. And, and then there's a playbook that I can probably download from my combinator's website on tells me how to do like exact hiring and all this other stuff. And I'm just going to power through the formula and I'm good to go. And I think that's how a lot of businesses have been built over the past five years. And I don't know if those are the most successful businesses, but they are, were still alive because they did a couple metrics correctly. And I think what's going to happen over the next four or five years is that path doesn't really exist anymore. And so the people that are actually going to be starting businesses are, I think, going to have a little bit more higher conviction. They're going to be a little bit tougher because a fundraising market, I think, will be quite a bit more challenging as well. And also what I generally hope, I'm sure maybe Zach can agree with this, is the brightest minds of our generation, maybe in 2012, were like Zach and figuring out how people can better click on ads. But we've wasted this entire generation of founders over the past three to four years that went to go build crypto companies. And they weren't building enterprise companies. They weren't building biotech companies. They weren't building things that actually can provide real value. And I think that has corrected a little bit. And so I think it is going to unlock an entire, a, entire amount of founders that maybe would have, you know, built Ponzi schemes and instead they're actually going to go provide enterprise value somewhere else. And so I think on that side, I'm actually quite, um, quite bullish on the next four or five years. I've heard this biotech thing could be big. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not smart enough for it, man. That's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> One thing you, you hit on, you hit on and, and like, we, we can, we can wrap it a second, but, uh, there's these like little hidden tricks inside the startup ecosystem that the founders are aware of because we kind of like talk to each other and everybody shares the dirty little secrets, but like aren't necessarily well understood. And you hit on one of them very subtly, which is this idea that like by the time I do my A or my B, maybe I have a business, maybe I don't, but the market is so frothy, I can go raise it at like a hundred post and I get to take like two or $3 million off the table, right? The like early founder secondary sale went from something that was kind of frowned upon and not really talked about to almost like in the docks by default at the series A and the series B. And, I, and I'm not, by the way, as a founder myself, I'm like, yeah, shit, if somebody's going to offer me the opportunity to do that in a business that take it, do it all day. And that's what I always advise the founders. Like if someone's offering you a few million dollars off the table and you're allowed to do it, take it. Like you should do it. With that said, it does create this like funky perverse incentive where run really fast, raise a bunch of money because you protect your downside, right? That like super hot 20 on 80 series A, maybe you need it, maybe you don't, maybe the business deserves it, maybe it doesn't, but you just got $3 million. Uh, and before that, you were not making $3 million a year, right? And, and there you get the, you know, the playbook founder. 
And by the way, it's kind of rational from the venture actor's perspective, having been on the other side of it, because it's like, hey, I don't want this guy or girl worried about two or three million dollars when I need them to try to go build the next plaid or the next flat iron. Right. And so if that's going to concern, if that's going to be a concern for them, like, let me take let me have them take a little bit of chips off the table. That used to happen, by the way, at like the Series C or the D yes. when there was a business and a model. Same valuation, just more proven business. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very pro, let me be on the record, I'm extremely pro-secondary. I think founders should take as much of it as they can. But I think what it has done is it's de-risked being a founder to an extent. Like, now we have conversations. We're like, hey, I don't know if I'm going to start a, start this company or should I go be an L5 engineer at Facebook? And I'm like, I don't get how you're making these two decisions. Like, they're very different. But in 2015, you like, you know, or like, you know, maybe 2020, 21, you would put that on a model. And honestly, maybe they probably should have been a founder, right? Because from a value capture perspective, they're kind of equal. But I just don't think they should be equal. And so hopefully that will correct a bit. William Hockey, thank you for doing this. Rashad said, best guest yet. He was talking about me, just to be clear. Uh, I, you know, a recurring guest, but uh, William, thank you for doing this. <laughs> well, I just think like, Logan, as a theme for us and whatever is like, Look, you find people, they talk about a bunch of bullshit all the time, but it's rare to get somebody. And I think, uh, what's his face was phenomenal at this because he told that David Sachs story. Parker Conrad. Parker. Yeah, he's the best. Uh, but like, you know, like I, I, I would work for Parker Conrad. Uh, just like the little, the, the, the war stories, I think are really interesting. And I think, by the way, that's what, as we wind down, hopefully the crypto series in my, my heart, I think you uh, talking to more founders like William, not that there are like that many like you, but just the ability to have those insights. I mean, that, that it's really interesting to go in uh, into this level of detail on some of this stuff. So thank you for doing it. Bye guys. See you guys. Everyone's favorite uh, barefoot Israeli hippie founder uh, is back at it again. So earlier this week, I'm sure as anyone that listened to this podcast probably saw, Adam Newman raised $350 million uh, from Mark Andreessen and Andreessen Horowitz, which was uh, the largest investment ever made by Andreessen Horowitz for his company that they're calling Flow. As I understood, there's not a ton of detail out there about what exactly they're doing. Um, I think some of the stuff we can probably speculate a little bit on. Uh, but the basic idea, as I understand it, is it's some version of a residential multifamily real estate we work. Um, but it seems like instead of leasing, uh, they're actually going to own these uh, these buildings. Um, I, I It's been reported. I'm not sure exactly where this came from. But uh, Flow has purchased around 3,000 apartment units, mostly across the uh, the American South, including Atlanta, Miami, and Nashville. Flow is going to operate uh, both the properties that Adam Newman has already bought, as well as offering managerial services to other owners and landlords. There also seems to be something of a crypto angle here. Forbes has reported that there's some digital wallet. They were hiring people for Web3. If you read Mark Andreessen's blog post about it, um, there is a uh, there's something about ownership and, and how uh, constituents don't own uh, elements of their community in the building, which as a student of Andreessen Crypto, I think uh, that's usually a harbinger for there's going to be a token uh, to come or something as as I've seen these things play out before. Um, there was a fair amount of indignation uh, about this online as uh, as Twitter is is wont to do, but um, I think that the criticisms of it were Adam Newman was able to successfully light a fair amount of money on fire with WeWork. I think they raised about $21 billion dollars and maybe are worth five to six today. Uh, so not exactly value uh, accumulating as well as uh, the other criticism was that there are um, thousands of women, people of color that don't even get a first chance at uh, raising even one one thousandth of the money that that Adam Newman's getting a, a second chance to go through. And so definitely some uh, valid criticisms about all that. Uh, maybe we'll get into that as we as we talk about this as a as a group, or maybe we'll just focus on Adam Newman and the idea itself. But uh, to help unpack some of these things and a lot of the debates we've seen on Twitter, uh, I figured I would have two different people on. So one, we have Maureen Farrell, who quite literally uh, wrote the book on WeWork. In 
entitled The Cult of We. Uh, she did that with Elliot Brown. And uh, Maureen is a journalist at The New York Times. And then we have Brad Hargraves, who is the founder of Common, uh, which Common raised $150 million-ish to date. Uh, essentially, and Brad, correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of tackling at least a similar concept to insofar as we know what Adam Newman's doing. There's definitely some parallels to it to the point that you had a Twitter thread about it and a bunch of people suggested I talk to you about this topic. So uh, that was a mouthful for me. Did I have most of that stuff for right for you too? Yeah, pretty much. Good deal. Uh, and then we'll have Rashad as well, our uh, uh, the Red Point TikTok guy, as he is colloquially <laughs> known, uh, and our our producer uh, on the podcast uh, kind of chime in as well. But uh, may- maybe to bat lead off. So, so Maureen, there's been a bunch of different um, documentaries or dramatic portrayals of what happened with WeWork. Obviously, you wrote a book, Cult of We. But just so everyone's on the same page here, what what ultimately happened down the stretch of that like very weird kind of? I mean, I guess you could say whatever, 12 year period, but the very specific three months that ultimately were, uh, was Adam Newman's uh, undoing with, with WeWork, the company. I think people probably, all these things sort of came of the same vintage, Theranos, Uber, WeWork. Like, I think people confuse a little bit who did what and like how bad the sins were. So maybe just a level set. What, what, what happened with WeWork down the stretch there? Sure. So basically, you know, Adam Newman had raised billions of dollars. Uh, it was really like supercharged through this fund that saw Fank, this Japanese investing conglomerate, gave them billions. It gave Adam Newman, we worked billions of dollars. They were worth $47 billion at the beginning of 2019. They were on a path to go public. The whole banking world, uh, you know, everyone was sort of infatuated with this company. Obviously, there's some pe- a lot of people critiquing it. But banks um, who were hoping to take this company public and lead their IPO were telling Adam Newman this could be a trillion dollar company or at least like worth, you know, a hundred billion dollars. I remember the minute the S1 came out or like within 24 hours, a lawyer who works on a lot of these deals, but not on this one, said he read it. And he's like, you know, there's a menu of things that founders can do to push the envelope. Usually they pick a couple of things on the menu and, um, you know, in terms of having control and different things you can do. And Adam Newman picked every single one of those and then some really. I mean, his wife was one thing, like she was going to designate his successor, be part of the team if anything ever happened to him. Uh, You know, he owned so many buildings. He had essentially, I mean, we had reported that he had taken my colleague Elliot Brown and I and my co-author earlier in the summer that he had taken out more than $700 million in loans and stock sales from the company. And it basically, I, I can't remember exactly what the S1, but it showed it was maybe even more than that. And, um, you know, people had just never seen really anything like this, even in this era where, you know, we saw most founders had a lot of control, like basically controlled the board. They have been giving these super voting shares. Adams ties to the company were so wild and the financials just weren't good. Literally, I remember reporting this, you'd hear like, okay, well maybe for $25 billion, it can go out, maybe 20 billion. It just kept on ticking down and down and down. But the final real nail in the coffin for Adam Newman was my colleague, Elliot, um, my co-author, wrote an article, and this was, this was just him, this was something he had been reporting on for a really long time, and it was essentially about Adam Newman flying to Israel with marijuana on the plane and leaving this um, marijuana in a tissue box on the plane, and the authorities being called, and he couldn't fly back on this plane. Basically, also within that, once that story came out, I guess the company was freaking out every single uh, advisor to them, I remember someone in Silicon Valley calling me and they said, Adam Newman will be CEO in 48 hours. Um, no one can sign off on this company anymore because it was a felony. You were, it's in the Wall Street Journal that he transported marijuana, you know, on a, in, in an international flight. No one can sign off on this company anymore. Like, and it was, I think, within 40 he was out, not, not 48 hours. So, so, so down the stretch of this, just what was his mindset uh, at that point in time? And to the extent you can comment on it, like, uh, w- have you kept up with what he's been doing since then? Or, or like, was this a very, b- I've seen him 
wandering around Miami before uh, in the last two years. And it's like uh, almost where's Waldo. It's this very tall <laughs> Israeli man walking around. And so like I've seen him around, but I don't really know like shoes or no shoes, Logan. Uh, I, I one time with and one time without Miami. It's a little more acceptable to go shoeless. Yeah, <laughs> it's Miami, though. I, I, in fairness. Yeah, exactly. Like one in three people don't know. Shoes. I was going to say versus the you know whatever uh where astor place or wherever else i've seen him oh we're walking shoeless but so, so like what was his mindset at that time uh as he stepped out and then to the extent you've kept up at all with people in and around him do you have any perspective on like what he's been like since since then sure i mean first of all i get without i don't really ask people for this but like as you said, the Where's Waldo? I mean, he's spot. You can't not spot him, I guess, if he's somewhere. He's so tall and distinctive. And um, so I just get so many texts on his whereabouts. <laughs> like, I don't need to know this, but uh, he's spotted often by so many different friends of mine um, and just various people I know. But uh, he, so at that time, when this deal fell apart with Masa in late 20. 20- 18. I mean, he was going to be on top of the world. They're going to be private forever. They were going to be direct partners on limited sums of capital to sort of like really like world domination, the two of them. Fell apart. He was like utterly shocked by it. By all accounts, it seems like he had no idea this was going to happen. He thought he could still, you know, people would be willing to do anything to get into the company and it was going to be his forever. So I think he was completely in shock that he could ever lose power when i talk to people about um you know how he's been since he left power and lost we work people will tell me he's been humbled he's learned like really great lessons he's like you know been even more focused on his family um i don't know you know he's a master storyteller he's a he's really masterful at bonding and connecting with people um so you know who knows what is there but that that has been something he has articulated to a lot of people this like humbling and speculation had always been that you know there was no way you could not keep him down for long he was going to have a next act and it was going to be bigger and wilder and crazier than the first and who knows but this seems like in keeping getting Mark Andreessen to write the biggest check he's ever written to him and find another person to sort of join forces with to take over the world. <laughs> yeah, no, it's an interesting, I mean, that kind of dovetails into uh, the, the uh, what he's doing today with flow. And I guess he's always had something of an interest in uh, residential real estate as I've understood. I mean, we live was some, was part of uh, the, we work thing. And I think maybe they have one building in downtown New York and, and nothing really came of it, but, but Brad, maybe over to you, uh, can you give a little bit of, uh, of background on what common, yeah, is just I, I know I did a little bit of a preamble at the top uh, what you guys have been up to and then uh, maybe we can use that as a uh, segue into some of the parallels between uh, what, what you guys did and also uh, what we know about this company flow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me on. So uh, common, you know, is a designer and operator of innovative residential spaces. So we started back in 2015 initially with co-living, so shared apartments, but we expanded into micro apartments, live workspaces, family-oriented apartments, uh, and today manage around 7,000 units um, across the U.S. And by the way, micro apartments are, can, can you just explain that? Yeah, tiny apartments um, really designed with affordability in mind. You know, many of the buildings are really community-oriented, so there's a lot of programming as part of it. People form bonds. Um, so, you know, we always, uh, you know, shortly after we started back in 2015, we work launched We Live, um, which, you know, had a very similar high-level thesis, very different implementation and approach. Funny enough, we actually manage one of the buildings that were formerly We Live today. Uh, it's about a 300-unit building outside D.C. Um, and it does, it does, does quite well. Um, but, you know, it's, it, from our vantage point, there needed to be a lot more innovation around real estate, around layouts, around design, around operations. Too many developers just come out and build the same thing they build, you know, in the early days of Common, a developer told me, I don't build what the tenant wants, I build what the bank wants. And that is really a sentiment that is pervasive in this industry. 
And so we looked at this in the early days as let us build residential housing as a consumer product, not a financial product. And even though what we do is very different than what Adam was doing with WeLive and I think what he's doing with Flow, although nobody really knows what he's doing with Flow, it's all sort of in the same universe using a lot of the same language. And so, so what was We Live uh, as, as you would draw the distinctions between what Common does? Well, in my view, it's a great example of convergent evolution where they were approaching it from a very different set of fundamentals. That is, they knew how to do office space. They were exceptionally good at renovating and building out office space, at negotiating leases. And they wanted to build housing. So they went about that by taking two office buildings, one in Crystal City, Virginia, and another in uh, at 110 Wall Street, and converting them to residential. That is really, really tough to do. It requires an immense amount of capital. Office buildings, particularly the kind they chose, these 1960s era, you know, boxes basically with square square floor plates don't work very well for residential. There's a big unlit core. You have to run gas lines, more electric lines, more plumbing. The elevators are often awkwardly located. So you end up with these oddly shaped units. And so, so as, as uh, I guess the overlapping part of this that I think we'd all agree on, but at least what, what you were doing with common, what we live was doing, what flow seems to be doing is, Hey, affordable housing in urban, uh, areas that, that people want to live in is clearly broken in some way, shape or form. Right. And we can debate to what extent we can debate how to solve it, but it's not a, uh, efficient and friendly market, uh, for on the consumer side, right. It, it's serving a different master. And so everyone kind of sees this problem and it's an ambitious one. I, I you know, I, I, I admire you for huge market. Yeah. Huge market, right? Literally like the biggest market, uh, you draw a Tam and, uh, this is a, a very, very big one. My hunch though is obviously it's a big Tam. It checks a lot of boxes that there was another angle here that fueled it. Just knowing a little bit, uh, about the arc here and having read a lot of great work about, you know, the mentality. Uh, within WeWork, uh, including what Maureen and Elliot wrote, um, is that residential is in some ways a much more fertile ground for building community than office space. Because in residential, everyone who is a part of that community is choosing to be a part of that community. They're opting in. A big part of the issue with office, and I actually I ran a co-working space back in 2010, 2011, is that most of the people who work there are not opting into that community. They just happen to work at a company that has a space. The founder may be opted in, the right. office manager may be opted in, the CFO may be opted in, but the rank and file didn't choose to be, you know, a part of that building, right? But in residential, everyone's opting in and it's much more natural to have a party in your building, in your apartment, than it is to have a party at your office. And I think that was part of a driver too. And so, I mean, community was always, and it's it's become a meme, like community adjusted EBITDA or whatever, right? Uh, in in WeWork, but that was always an element of what they sold, and it, it it always felt like kind of a square peg round hole. And I guess I guess to your point here, like maybe there there is something that as as uh, someone that was once young in New York looking for apartments, like there is this sense of uh, or this lacking of community in some of these cities that and getting to know your neighbors and and all of that stuff. like there's clearly something that people are yearning for uh, that you know maybe fifty years ago was filled by organized religion and churches and all that, right? And like now there's there's this element of something there. And so that I guess your point is this was an awkward fit. They, they liked that within WeWork, but it was always kind of an awkward fit. Can I actually ask Maureen a question? Because I think there's an interesting thread here, which is, do you already believe that at WeWork, Adam truly believed and bought into the community narrative? Or did he see it as a convenient way to build momentum and valuation? Um, I think he legitimately actually believed in the community. My hunch, too. Yeah. I mean, even like just from, he tells the story, but I've talked to a lot of people who were with him at the time is like, he moved to New York from Israel. Um, he moved in with his sister who was a model and she had this, um, apartment. It's where he met, uh, 
I think it was there exactly that he met his co-founder, Miguel, but that he, like, he got went to this uh, apartment building downtown and it was all, like, 20-something people. No one talked to each other. And then him and his sister, like, joked that they wanted to, they were like, oh, in Israel, everyone talks to each other. This is so weird. We want to build community here. Or not, I don't think he said this, but he's like, let's see who can meet the most people. And then it really, I've talked to a lot of people who lived in that building. They were like, yeah, all of a sudden everyone was like friends in the building. Like they really um, facilitated that. So I think that, I mean, that was truly the magic of the early WeWorks that he did foster this community. That aligns with my understanding of it as well and my hunch that this is, a, the belief is coming from a, a, a genuine place. And, you know, in my view, residential is pretty obviously a more obvious play, you know, a, a, a more fertile ground to build that kind of community mm -hmm. and to build the kind of community that from all the stories you hear is what they're looking for. And, you know, for example, I know the, one of the first buildings they bought as a part of flow is society Las Olas in Fort Lauderdale. And, uh, you don't, I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure that's public, but, um, it's a great asset. It's an ultra class A beautiful luxury asset. And it is fully branded around building a party community. It is not, it's, it's, there's a little bit of wellness there. There's a little bit of mindfulness, but it's clearly appealing to someone who wants to party. And that in my view is, is frankly much easier to do. And it's much more natural when you're building apartment buildings than when you're building office space. And so, Brad, uh, class A in this, like, and building a a uh, party centric class, like, what is it? What are those terms for people that are outside the real estate? Like, how does that actually manifest itself? A class A I, is that the highest class of of buildings? Or the jargon. Thank you for calling me out on it. Uh, that just means you have your your shiny, beautiful glass tower with every amenity space the designer was able to cook up, and it is highly programmed. There's probably a concierge in the lobby. There is a calendar of events posted in the elevator. You've got yoga on Saturdays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. You've got a DJ playing on Friday and Saturday. You've got a garden on the roof. You've got an apiary. Like, it's highly, highly programmed. So it's it's the villages for uh, for the fratty sorority group, right? Precisely. Yeah, I uh, got it. Got it. So so this is now going down in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, what does capital outlay for something like that look like? Like, uh, I mean, in generalities, like, are you paying $100 million to buy this building or something like that? Uh, my hunch would be $150 million for an asset of that size. I don't know. I don't know the details of that at all. And, and that's how many units? I'd say around 500. Oh, wow. OK. But remember, that's uh, your unlevered total cost. You're then going to put 75 percent leverage on top of that. So your actual equity outlay there is only going to be, say, 35, 40 million dollars. So that's an interesting point for my like simple venture uh, software oriented brain is there's a lot of different capitalization structures that you can do in real estate with these these hard assets rather than the the bits and bytes that I uh, that I typically work with. And so like how can this actually be, as you sort of lay out the the potential path, obviously the market size is there, but but what are the steps to actually making this a venture scalable business, right? I, I, I was looking at, someone tweeted, Graystar has spent 30 years to get to 750,000 units, right? Maybe doing 350 million in revenue. And like that business might be worth, you know, 600, 700 million, just based on like that part of the business. I know that they do a bunch of other stuff and we'll put the the actual tweet itself in the show notes. But I, I, I get it's an interesting service. I'm sure at 23, I would have loved to go to Fort Lauderdale and party there. But like, how do you get this to be something that at a billion dollar valuation or whatever uh, Andreessen funded it at, that it can actually be a 10, 20, 50 billion dollar type opportunity? That's why I think this is sort of a actually a really good founder opportunity fit because you kind of need someone who is a bit of a lunatic to pull this off. Yeah. They are really trying to create this hospitality like consumer brand for residential. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess as 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 I sort of think about like what the potential use case is in these different neighborhoods, and you sort of talk about the long term stay uh, component of it. Um, there is Airbnb has really traded off. Like there is this some uniqueness to Airbnb, right? But the you don't get the consistency, and you're there's no community associated with it, right? And so I guess I was kind of thinking about, hey, if you could do, and we're seeing more and more people in their 20s want to spend, you know, summers in Miami or LA or, or winters in Miami or LA, and then summers in New York or wherever, right? And so I guess as I sort of thought about what the idealized state of this is, let's throw the crypto thing to a side because I, you know, whatever, I don't believe in that kind of stuff. So let's just throw that out because that's distracting. <laughs> uh, but if you sort of think about like the utility of it, uh, I I, I kind of get it, right? Like I kind of think, oh, well, if I can have the exact same room in, I don't know about Fort Lauderdale, but in Miami as I do in New York and there's a community in each place and I'm 24 and we can go out together, I guess I kind of understand it. And it seems like the guy that was passing, uh, Maureen, I'm sure it, you, you remember these stories or have all these stories, but the guy that's passing tequila shots around at like 2 p.m. on a on a Tuesday afternoon is probably like a good person to enable this, right? I guess where I keep going back to is like, does the math actually hold? It feels like kind of a financial engineering, like, yes, there's this community element of it, right? Yes, there's this visionary funding element of it. But it feels like there's going to be a lot of like tactical financial operations associated with, uh, you know, how to lever these things, how to um, how to how to actually structure the the individual tenants. Like one of the advantages of selling B2B is that, you know, these leases can be a couple years versus when you're dealing with consumers, they're going to be much more fickle and you're dealing with credit reports and all that stuff. And so it just feels like a, a super complicated thing to get to the big pie at the end is that is that is that fair like this just seems like a very hairy problem that sounds good but like might be really hard to execute on yeah i mean i think that you know residential management is hard this is a hard business i and and here's an example in residential when you're dealing with long-term leases occasionally people stop paying and you have to evict them that is part of the process that is part of the business if you're Graystar, if you are a huge property manager, you evict people all the time, nobody thinks about it. The first time somebody gets evicted from Flow, they are going to go to the press and it's going to be a whole cycle of Adam Newman is evicting tenants. It's a, the Waymo driving problem. Like one car, you know, people die in car accidents all the time, but one Waymo car kills one person and like every you know that's headlines everywhere so i'm interested from an investment perspective now a little bit understanding the personalities of the behind these firms like i guess logan uh like isn't this a huge risk from a reputation perspective like why would andreessen do this it's an interesting question. I've seen a bunch of people say like, oh, Andreessen erased 12 years or 14 years of building a brand in one investment. And and I actually, from a my very cynical, like watching the machinations of the venture industry, I actually feel like this is the one of the most logical investments I've seen because, well, two things. One, I think Founders Fund has done a really good job of cornering the, hey, we back ambitious founders going after crazy ideas and we're... We, we will never replace you in all of that. And I think uh, to some extent they did it in the Palmer Lucky thing, right? And, and his next act with Andrew after Oculus, they did it with, uh, they did it with uh, Parker Conrad uh, after Zenefits, right? And they've really leaned into that brand. And to some extent, I feel like Andreessen Horowitz has, has almost suffered on the other end of that, especially with the Parker stuff, right? And so uh, to some extent, in a very cynical way, I think that this is actually a perfect uh, reclaiming of some element of that. When I was thinking, when, when someone asked me who di who who would have looked at this deal, I was like, well, Andreessen Horowitz did it. Founders Fund's the only other one that I can think would have even possibly touched this, like had enough money to do it, like touched the ambitions of this and all of that. And so from a branding standpoint, I actually think it's 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 great. And they have a lot of money. And as as Brad mentioned, like this is an enormous, enormous market. And who knows what the terms of the structure around all this stuff are. And so, I, I mean, one of the things that they just do, Andreessen Horowitz specifically does such a good job of is just like 
being on everyone's lips uh, on a very regular basis, right? And just like constantly, all these things get repositioned as they're reinventing X or Y, and like they became an RIA, and that became like they're reinventing the venture model and all these things. And so from a marketing standpoint, I feel like it's really logical for them. And then from a uh, ambitions and founder type standpoint, I think it makes a lot of sense that like they would be the ones to want this type of person in their tent. Um, now, from an investment standpoint, does it actually make sense? I, you know, I don't. That's where you really need a squint for me. But right. all the other things I think are super lo- like if, if this were 50 million, a, a, a power, a, whatever they have, 6 billion, 50 of 60, uh, sorry, 50 million of, of 6 billion, I'd be like, great, you know, biggest check ever. That's where I don't, I don't understand. But maybe there's some structure to it that, you know, there's more than meets the eye there. So Logan, that, um, I think the that's interesting and sort of, I don't know, a little bit terrifying to me in terms of just like the founder friendliness, because I think that's something we explored so much in the book, just like how far the pendulum had swung. It seems like it has seemed like, and granted, I've been on maternity leave for a few, the last few months as things have gotten really crazy, um, but that things have swung back and there's been maybe like a little more sanity in the market of not just giving, sa- I mean, that was the problem with all this, giving uh, Adam Newman carte blanche and no one giving him any boundaries. So it's scary to me, but and also, but also getting your rationale, knowing how things work, um, but all that said is, um, I mean, first of all, I just find it, I mean, the margins are thin on this business, um, at the end of the day. So I get Brad, like the, the, the TAM and the community. And I, and I get what you were saying earlier, Logan, like, even if I was, you know, in the, I, I could imagine there being a huge market for this, but I don't, I still don't get how you make money. And I think that's, in a big way or how you ever get a tech multiple for this. Oh, and and then one other point, my get, this is my speculation, but when you say it could have been Founders Fund or Mark, or Andreessen Horowitz, I sort of bet just knowing Adam Newman, again, pure speculation, I haven't had a chance to report on this, um, nor I don't know if I will, but um, I kind of picture him and Mark just bonding, having conversations, rather than him sort of taking this to people, but it like them brainstorming and coming together and Adam almost having the leverage to say like, I have all my own money from (laughs) SoftBank gave me, you know, from WeWork and that SoftBank gave me to leave. Um, I'll, you know, that's, I'll just pay for it myself. And that's his leverage there. And he's like, I don't even need money, but sure, if you'll give it to me, I'll let you be part of this. Like, I do think he ultimately did need some brand validation and Andreessen Horowitz, like what is, what is venture capital in general, uh, but some level of brand validation and hopefully some support and advice and comfort along the way. Right. And like, I guess you could say, I would be very interested in what the board structure and governance of this is, because you could argue either side of who needed who more. Did Adam Newman need Mark Andreessen and the stamp of the biggest check ever uh, coming in after he was uh, disgraced. My, I mean, you know, he, he didn't commit fraud, right? We can, we can talk about, uh, a bunch of the stuff that he did, but like I, I disgraced might be too strong of a word, but, but, uh, at a minimum, he got removed from his company or did Andreessen, you know, he is this high profile. I mean, what a top 10 most famous, uh, CEO like in the world right now. And, you know, I, I don't know. It would be very interesting to see, like, does Newman have a hundred percent control of the board because he's this famous CEO that built this company or, you know, did he touch the stove last time? And so they wrestled control and there needs to be checks and balances. I don't know. It's an interesting thing. That's a great point too, that like the buzz and why we're all like questioning this and intrigued and everything is like, the Andreessen Horowitz, if he just put three, if he put a billion dollars into this, we wouldn't, you're right. This is like a new, a stamp of something like he's, he's truly back and someone with a big name is willing to take a bet on him. What about the, like, if you were looking at this deal again, in this hypothetical situation, what about the airplanes and the, he spent $10 million on an offsite or whatever it was and smoking weed, like, is that stuff thing, you know, stuff that you think about, or is that just oh, that's part of being a lunatic and lunatic is a good thing when you're trying to found the next massive company. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, uh, listen, 
I think Elon Musk has broken everyone's brain and framework for like what can and can't be allowed uh, and what a successful CEO can and can't look like and do and all and all of that. And so do I think that uh, I don't know if Adam Newman can have the reclamation uh, path that he does now if Elon Musk wasn't <laughs> as successful as he has been. And you're sort of afforded a bunch of luxuries around uh, around all this craziness if you've if you've been successful and if you can pattern match someone to Elon Musk. I mean, who is the next closest clone of Elon Musk? Adam Newman's got to be on a short ish list of like people that could credibly be compared now i I, obviously one's created far far more equity value so yeah um but i don't know i think vcs at the end of the day are doing extrapolation and pattern matching in a lot of these things and i think uh elon musk has afforded a lot of people to uh to be crazy or be themselves so you know this has been on twitter i've gotten about like a dozen texts and emails on this um pattern matching if he was, um, if Adam Newman was a woman, a person of color, I mean, there's no, uh, that's like the first thing that people have, you know. Oh, totally. And and, and it's a very fair, uh, very reasonable criticism of, of this, right? And it's hard to know the counter counterfactual. Like it's sort of this self-fulfilling thing of like, well, women and people of color don't get enough money to begin with. And so we don't have so many data points to figure out would women and people of color get another chance, right? And so it's sort of like a first principles funnel problem that we're not even giving them a first chance, let alone a second chance, right? Um, and it's a very fair criticism. And um, it, to some extent, it's like, it should be the crux of the entirety of the story. And also uh, is is uh, such, uh, like can be distracting to, to the other elements of the story because that is such a fair criticism in general, right? I think what's come up a lot, people always ask me, so I'll just throw it out there, is like, well, Elizabeth Holmes could go to jail and Adam Newman's raising billions. And I think that's like a a really ridiculous comparison because I'll just put it out there. Like, and she was, it seems like, you know, fraud. People could have been died and were like, their lives were put in jeopardy and she was hiding things. Yeah. Fraud versus like pot and uh, healthcare versus office space. I think like those that two by two matrix, I think, gives you a little bit more forgiveness in there. But um, and Adam Newman also like people knew what they were getting into. I mean, they saw the financials. They saw it. He wasn't hiding things. They were willing to just believe this reality that he promised he would create. He you know, he may have fudged things on the margins, but um, there were no like blatant lies. It was just that people were willing to, you know, he would say one thing. And we always, we always call him in our book and kind of think about him like a magician, like, don't look here, look here. And well, he, he clearly had some like messianic quality to, uh, to it. But so Brad, what, um, as we, as we sort of wrap here, what, what do you think he will need to do without knowing the full vision of all this stuff? Like, what do you think for this to pan out and be the, company that Andreessen Horowitz is underwriting it to, to, to be, what are some of the, like the tactical milestones that you would want to see from, from here? Uh, because it, it feels like one of these things that's going to work on a small scale. And I guess it's kind of like to what end, right? There's the end state of what the public market's going to value it at. And that's going to be a long time from now, but w- what are like the little milestones that you're going to be interested to watch uh, over the course of the next you know, as, as this gets more public over the course of the next six months, two years, five years, is it is it the occupancy rates in these buildings? Is it, you know, the, the hype and momentum behind this stuff? Is it uh, the parties for sure? The parties. Yeah. The quality of the parties. I think we're all kind of dancing around a question here, which is what is he going to do or planning to do that is going to be framework breaking in this industry? Because I don't think his goal is to rebuild Avalon Bay, but 15% better. And Avalon Bay was, I know you referenced it earlier, but for people that don't know. They're a massive REIT. They own 40, 50,000 apartments nationwide. They're probably the closest thing we have to a residential brand today. So like AVB is their, uh, you know, their ticker symbol. Their uh, AVA is their kind of young millennial brand. You know, they also own like big luxury garden style. 
apartments in the suburbs, and they do have a they do have a consumer brand, just nothing compared to the big hospitality companies. I'm just looking this up. It's a $30 billion company founded in 1978 was what I was able to pull up. That sounds right. Yes. Um, and they own all, they're vertically integrated. They're re, they own and manage all their own assets. I believe all their assets are Avalon branded as well. And, you know, they've been broadly successful, but my hunch is that it is not Adam's aspir aspiration. It is not Mark Andreessen's aspiration to build Avalon Bay, but just a little bit better. And that's already been done. Avalon Bay already exists. Equity Residential already exists. They're another huge REIT that is pretty good with technology, with uh, building, you know, they've built some notion of a consumer brand. So that's where earlier we kind of pushed the crypto question aside. But I don't think you can really understand this if you push the crypto question aside. I truly do believe he is looking to create some new kind of ownership and that the community element of, of what he's doing, what he's thinking probably is tied in with that sense of ownership, almost perhaps more comparable to say a board Ape Yacht, Yacht Club where people are part of a community and this is a bit of a physical manifestation of that. So I think you have to kind of draw from the crypto world and some crypto precedent and that puts a different lens on it. But I think whatever they do, I don't, I wouldn't be watching occupancy. I mean, obviously you have to watch occupancy rates, but like, who cares? You know, their collections rate, who cares? Ultimately, if they're going to achieve their goal and you're talking to big valuation, you're talking a lot of money, you're talking big names who have plenty of cash already. Yeah. They're going after something big. And I think you have to draw from other industries and other things that they're both doing to start a piece together a narrative about what they might be doing here. Brad, I think that's like, you. it feels like you hit the nail on the head with that. There's some big thing that this is all predicated on that we don't get. Because, I mean, just to bring it back to WeWork, um, the business model never worked, you know, and now they've, they've sort of returned to their roots as an office space leasing company. The $47 billion, maybe someday they will find a way somewhere, but it's a $4 billion company right now. You know, there's no um, the scale. You just can't, uh, it's not a SaaS, you can't turn office-based leasing into a SaaS company. And you think Mark Andreessen, as much as people want to believe in Adam Newman, the visionary, there's something that they're at least trying to build this upon that's not just like straight up residential uh community because you just can't turn it into this like a tech multiple ever and we learn that very clearly so it's it's really interesting that you bring that up well as someone that that once a week stands behind a uh, microphone and records uh himself talk adam newman mark andreessen crypto billion dollar value this is like the bingo card of all bingo cards so i uh, i don't i don't imagine there's going to be a shortage of like interesting things that come out of come out of this uh, uh but i appreciate you guys coming on and talking uh any, any final thoughts before we uh we hop I think I think that was that was my final one. This, but it was this has been fun. Uh, yeah, thank thank you guys for doing this. And that'll do it for the thirtieth episode of Cartoon Avatars. Thank you to William Hockey for coming on. Uh, not co-host Zach Weinberg as usual, as well as Maureen Farrell and Brad Hargraves. Uh, and look forward to seeing everyone next week for episode thirty-one. Thanks everyone for joining. 